All right, we'll go ahead and call this work session to order. This is a work session on AO 2023-67, um, and we'll do um, introductions, and I'll start by noting Mr. Myers is with us, and he just stepped out of the room for a minute. Um, and go ahead, Mr. Johnson. Zach Johnson. Karen Bronga. Daniel Voland. Meg Zalatel. Cameron Perez Villa. Anna Brawley. Great. And on the phone. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Um, and around the table here. Uh, Mike Curl, Anchorage Police Department. Daryl Hess, Municipal Ombudsman. Ann Hauser, Municipal Attorney. Hi, Charles Gunther, Municipal Attorney's Office. Musical Mike's Kent Colhase, Municipal Manager. And Mr. Solt is with us as well. He just, there he is. Um, all right. So um, I'm going to uh, first offer uh, the sponsor an opportunity to um, set us up for this work session. And then I believe we have um, the folks at the table here ready to uh, provide some additional input. And it looks like, and we have an S version before us, which is from the administration. Mr. Rivera? Yeah, Great. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Um, as you can tell, I am filling in today. Um, so with that, Chief Curl. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'd like to request a couple minutes for a personal privilege. Sure. Uh, so I woke up this morning at four o'clock. And the reason I woke up, it, it was referenced this meeting and other meetings. And it's my opinion and the opinion of other members of the police department that the assembly and the police department have a very adversarial relationship right now. And it's very, uh, it's been confusing to me and I, I don't understand why. Uh, I'm not a political figure. My department's not political. We have the same goals as the assembly. And I mean, my two goals are the safety of the citizens of Anchorage and the safety of my department. Those are my main, my main goals. And, uh, I look at the experience of my just my command staff alone. I have over 110 years of police experience. You might say we're experts. We've been trained by the FBI and every other federal agency. Uh, the Southern Police Institute, which is a, a police in training facility, a Northwestern University. We have we know the law. We know we're use of force experts. We're traffic experts. We go to a lot of training. We are the public safety experts. I have diverse, very diverse background. I had 11 years in, as a military commission officer. Uh, people who worked at Sears as managers, cars as managers, former police officers at other agencies. We just have a vast amount of knowledge. And uh, we are the public safety experts. And uh, it seems as of late that we've been left out of a lot of the initial, this is one of them, a lot of the initial drafting of these ordinances that are or changes that are proposed and what happens there is that the reason the adversary comes in there is minds are already made up and i actually if you google it it's a how do you change someone's mind and this is the quote that i got it's not easy and it's not frequent and when when public safety is not involved in making decisions initially and minds are made up when i come in and try to present the public safety's side of it, it's just so hard to get those opinions across. And I, I think I don't like the adversary. Like I said, I'm not political at all. So uh, I know we all have the same goal. It's public safety. When I provide advice here, it has not personal opinion. It's not political. It's for the safety of the citizens that we all serve. So 
Thanks, Chief Curl. And um, this issue has been brought up to assembly leadership, and we are um, having some conversations about maybe some processes we can look at to ensure greater collaboration. So I appreciate you sharing your concern with everyone. Uh, with that, can we turn to your presentation? So with that, we'll go to the presentation. This was a, uh, it says prepared by my traffic sergeant, Noel. I've actually added some slides on there based on uh, information that was requested in one of the previous meetings. Uh, so why does the scoff law exist? Uh, basically, it's uh, there's a lot of dangerous and aggressive drivers out there on the street. Uh, Jenny Morris, that's a story she uh, went through, and she was a victim, and she made sure that the scoff law was adopted at the state, and subsequently it was adopted uh, by the city. Uh, scoff law drivers have a demonstrated and accumulated history of not following traffic laws, and there's they're high risk drivers, and they endanger the public, and they rarely face consequences, and the scoff law right now is the last consequence that we have for these drivers. Uh, how did someone get on the scoff law? They get pulled over for violating the traffic law. They get a citation. They don't pay their fine. The court system sends them to us. Uh, if they accumulate more than $1,000 right now of unpaid traffic fines. Uh, they're notified. Their name appears on the scoff law list. And then we don't go out and actively find these people. They actually have to commit another traffic offense. And when they commit that additional traffic offense, we stop them. And uh, if we look on the list to see if they're there, we tell them you're on the scoff law list and we can take the vehicle. We, if we know they're on there, we're gonna take the vehicle and send, give them another, whatever ticket they got for that offense. Uh, did I go? So you don't, typically become a scoff law through equipment. Uh, most equipment violations are fixed tickets. They're usually between $50 and $75. Uh, and you, you have the opportunity to actually fix those tickets, like a headlight out, a tail light out. Uh, even if you don't have proof of insurance, you do have the ability to come down to the police station. And proof of insurance is a huge one. That's $500. Uh, if you don't have the proof of insurance, you have the ability to get on there and bring your proof of insurance and say, hey, look, I do have insurance. Uh, the registration also, a lot of times if you go to court and you show the judge, hey, my registration has been fixed, a lot of times they will dismiss that ticket as well. Uh, and it takes a lot of time for the citations to actually make it through the system for you to get on the scoff law. Uh, the average scoff law person has uh, seven to eight unpaid traffic sites. Uh, and we do pass out this little pamphlet. If people say they can't afford it, there are ways to work with the court system. I know there's we don't do it at the city as far as uh, making a payment plan, but there is a way to do it through the court. And we do provide this information to people and it's available online as well. Uh, how many people on scoff law? Well, I showed you this once before. This is just, there's about 9,000 people on the scoff law. This is uh, the packet right here. I haven't updated this since the first meeting. So uh, th this is probably not the accurate list, but. There's about 9,000 typically on, on the list. It uh, represents about 1% to 2% of the driving population of Anchorage. It's probably, you'll see I do some slides later. It's probably even less than that. Uh, these are some of the typical uh, violations. As you can see, uh, no license, suspended, revoked, or they just didn't get a license. Insurance violations quite a bit. Uh, misuse of plates, speeding, careless. The equipment violations, uh, there's 2302 seatbelts and a lot of these lower ones, like I said, to get to a thousand dollar fine, you need 20, 10, 15, 20 to, before you'd ever even get on the scoff law. Sure. Mr. Perez Verdia. I just wanted, I want to clarify something. I think I'm, I'm confused about the, the getting on the scoff law you said was the second violation puts you on the scoff law. Is that correct? No, it's an accumulation. So you have to have enough. So you could get on the scoff law after two violations. Okay. You could, if you, if it was a thousand dollars. So I see it was the amount of the, it's the total amount. So you have to have a thousand dollars in unpaid fines. Okay. So if okay. you had, if we stopped you for a no headlight and it's a $50 correctable fine, if we stopped you 20 times. Right. That would be a thousand dollars if you didn't fix any of those. I see. So when you're saying an average, you're saying the, when you were saying the people who are on the list have an average of this many of 70 citations, citations. but that's, but, but that doesn't get them on the list. Get them on the list is, is, is thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. Okay. Thank you. I want to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Ferris for you. Please go ahead, chief. 
Uh, so the paperwork violations, uh, we think uh, paper, some of these are pretty important because it is dark in here in Alaska quite a bit. So uh, lights, we consider these dangerous vehicles. If you don't have the proper lights, I think driving with insurance, uh, that's significant. Uh, it causes significant harm to people when they're involved in accidents and the other people don't have insurance. Uh, even if we removed a lot of these, uh, there it's just, uh, let's see. Uh, if you don't include these on the scoff, live, uh, scoff law, uh, it's just, you're allowing dangerous vehicles to be out there on the street. And that, that's one thing to, if you couple a dangerous driver with a dangerous vehicle, you're just asking for trouble. Uh, here's the same thing about headlights and brake lights. They're, again, they're just, it's important that we, here in Alaska, and I know we're, we're looking at bike safety rules, making it better for pedestrians. Uh, it's important that bikes and pedestrians and horses and other things, it's important that they be able to see the cars that are coming at them. I mean, it's already, uh, a lot of times the lights are so dim now that it's hard to see lights coming, uh, cars coming anyway. So without lights, operable lights, uh, even if you have just one headlight, it skews the perception and it really makes it dangerous. Uh, so impounds, not we don't have the ability uh, any longer to impound every every vehicle that's driven by someone that's suspended, canceled, or revoked, even if they have no insurance. Uh, those used to be automatic impounds. Uh, the laws have changed, and uh, I could go over that, but very seldom do we actually are we actually impounding vehicles for a lot of those violations because they're not if you can move if you're on private property we don't impound your vehicle if it's uh, in a position where it's legally parked we don't impound the vehicle so it's got to be a, a in a place that it's a hazard and then we actually impound the vehicle uh, so there are still uh, plenty of those vehicles out there that are on the street that that were driven by people that don't have licenses and that are insured and the one thing I will say, and this is my point about when we do impound for scoff law, and I know this, I'm beating a dead horse here, but they are on the list, they're stopped again for committing a violation, even if the vehicle doesn't belong to them. When we impound that vehicle from that dangerous driver, he is not, he or she is not driving that vehicle from that point to continue that aggressive driving. And I understand where it, it poses the, a financial burden on some people. I I still say that the financial burden of if that vehicle is involved in an accident down the road is more, a, would be more of a concern to the owner of a vehicle who lent their vehicle to somebody than if we impound the vehicle. And the impoundments do prevent collisions in the future. So I have a question and so does Mr. Perez for Dia. Is it possible then to, you know, and just thinking in the art of compromise to somehow not punish the vehicle owner because of someone else's action, because unless they're checking the scoff law list, because someone's not likely to say, Oh, Hey, can I borrow your car? And by the way, I'm a scoff law. Um, you know, like I, I'm trying to think that through a little bit because we know that when people can't get access to their vehicles, it has substantial additional ramifications around jobs, childcare, et cetera. So this is where our 110 combined years of experience come in. Uh, so we see this and you guys see it and if you, if for our newest members. If you haven't received complaints about junk vehicles yet, you will start receiving them. So we know what is going to happen if we don't impound vehicles that are the owners. The, the people who drive aggressively are going to just register vehicles in a fictitious name so that there's no way if once they find out that we're not going to impound their vehicle they're just going to register it in joe smith's name and that therefore when we stop them if we don't impound the car because it belongs to joe smith then we're not going to it's going I think to you're misunderstanding my question. I'm sorry. Or the compromise oh, I'm suggesting, which yeah. isn't that we necessarily don't impound the car, well, but that we can somehow get rid of the fee for legitimate cars to be retrieved because if they're false registrations, it would be really hard to retrieve those cars anyway. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how we would do that, though. Uh, okay. I think it would I'll, be worth, it would be something, if we can actually identify the owner 
and somehow identify them. I'm not sure how we actually do that, but I mean, that is a compromise. Okay, thanks. Mr. Perez Verdia, then Mr. Salt. Yeah, my question is the use the use of the word aggressive, and I, I, maybe I'm I'm just not getting this. The, so in order to be on the list, your fines have to be a thousand thousand dollars, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how, why are these these people on the list then um, called aggressive drivers? What's the relationship between between a thousand dollars in fines and aggressive dr driver? I guess uh, we 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 understand that we know the driving behavior of a lot of the individuals. And it is, it's very aggressive and they, they drive dangerously and they unsafe vehicle, unsafe lane changes, not using their blinker, all those things. They, they drive in a manner that just puts the, the public at risk and, and they accumulate fines that way. It's just a, so that, that's what I'm trying to understand is, is it, is it, is it, is it the violations that they are, that are leading to the thousand dollars are deemed aggressive driving violations and that is why the people that are on the list are considered aggressive drivers, or is it that you, in you, just in your experience, the people who have acquired that many, that much in fines happen to be aggressive drivers? It, it's the, the, the latter, the second part. Okay. All right. And yeah. I'm sure there are people on there on the list that aren't aggressive drivers. Okay. I'm just trying to understand if, if when you have 9,000 people, I guess it is unfair of me to classify everyone as an aggressive driver. Yeah, no, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it because if 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 this, per one of the purposes of the scoff law is to is to get aggressive drivers off of the road, then the violations that would put them on the scoff law would be aggressive driving violations, and we would be going, these are dangerous PPP people. We need to take their car away. Doesn't sound like that. That's what this is. That this is a if you've acquired this many fines, we take your car, regardless if you're aggressive driver or not. It's just you've 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 broken the law enough that we would want to remove your car is that correct uh not that you broke the law you just haven't paid your well fine. You, you, you haven't, haven't paid, paid your fines, fines. yes that, okay. that's what it gotcha okay thanks thank you mr soul thanks madam chair so i'd maybe say i'm safe um so two parts one on the uh the number of vehicles that are impounded how many do not belong how you want to look at it are not the violator's car they borrowed. So I have a slide. I have an average. Okay. I, I do have a slide later on that will cover that. And, and then I think what Ms. Alto is getting to is, you know, if, if I lent someone my car, it got taken away, I shouldn't be penalized. I should have to pay a fee. And, and maybe that is waived for me. Um, I'm still going to have a penalty that I have to go get my car out of impound, which is a big inconvenience for alert me to not lend, lend this person a car again. But I kind of agree with that. There's probably a compromise that you know, we could figure out. All right, let's see. So about 13.75% of all serious or fatal collisions in 21 and 22 were people on the scoff law. Uh, let's see. I, the whole thing is how everyone wants us to quantify. I, I don't know how we quantify this to say the, the only thing, and I, I, I know uh, it was mentioned before, I don't mean this to be fear-mongering, if we do away with it and then we can two years down the road, we do a study and say, well, the number of fatal collisions went up to 20% and we can say, Oh, I guess this did work. So it's just really hard to quantify now. And I'm not sure that we can say that it, it is working, but I don't think we can say that it's not working either. Uh, but it is, the, it is the opinion. So I will add this. It is the opinion that we will see an increase in traffic fatalities if the scoff law program is ended. So uh, someone mentioned the race sample. They thought that this was, uh, uh, I did a, just a sample of one page of this, page 15 of this, uh, just to do a breakdown. Someone wanted the demographics. To go through all 9,000 would have taken my people forever. So uh, 80 of the people were white. So if we add that up, 80, 100, so the 130 people that were on the list, 80 were white, 20 were black, 20 were Alaska Native or American Indian and 10 were Asian uh, Pacific. You, you can see the percentages right there. Nothing really stands out there. It's uh, pretty close to what our demographics are here in Alaska. Uh, so other things that were on there, three individuals were deceased. So I didn't put those in the numbers. I don't think it was fair to them. Uh, 15 had warrants, misdemeanor. Uh, three individuals had felony warrants. 
only 26 of the 130 actually had valid licenses and uh, 104 were either had no license, expired, suspended, canceled, or revoked. And again, that was just a random sample, but usually it, it might hold true for the whole list. Uh, where do they live? We covered this a little bit. Just uh, This was a random, just 59 random individuals. Because it's a lot of work to get this stuff. My traffic sergeant was on leave for three weeks. So 73% lived in Anchorage, 7% out of state, and then 20% in other parts of Alaska. And those are the ones that come in here uh, on the weekend or their commuters that come in. So Randy, here's the answer to your question. So what happens after impound? So I actually have another thing in here, but so this was a, a sample. I got this from uh, Vulcan. Uh, and this is just from January 1st to December, uh, June 20th. So 83 vehicles were released to the owner. And of that, they collected 66,584 in fines. Uh, 90, 90 vehicles were auctioned. And I guess I don't have the answer to your question, how many don't belong. I thought that this was going to be on there. But of the uh, 173 vehicles that were actually impounded for scofflaw during that time period, you can see 83 were actually paid. The owners came and picked them up. And then 90 of them weren't. They were auctioned off. And you're going to see the invoice total to Vulcan. This has nothing to do. This goes along with the fines paid to the city. The fines paid to the city are not included in this. These are just the, the, the towing and storage charges that Vulcan incurred. Uh, so 373,000 uh, invoice total. When they auctioned off the 90 vehicles, they received 96,000. And then they had to send the other 276,869 to collections. Uh, I know there was a concern whether who was making money off the sale of these cars. Uh, do we have that other, is that other chart here? The other one? It won't be on that one. No. Nope. Yeah, that's the same. It's posted online. Post doesn't have access to it. So the other one, basically, it broke down all the vehicles by year, make, model, and it told what the fines were and what the uh, auction total was. And I looked at every single one of them that she gave me for that time period, and not a single uh, one of, not a single uh, auction vehicle was more than the actual total that they owed the, the tow company. Uh, so they're not making money off it. I don't, and I personally, I, I hate getting, the police should never be involved in any money-making thing. This is not about money-making. This is about making sure that we have safe drivers and safe vehicles on the street. Thanks. Um, before we go on, Ms. Brawley? Yeah, thank you. Um, going back to the, the demographics briefly, but then I have a question. Um, I just wanted to note, and so this is a small sample size, so I also don't want to draw conclusions from that, although I understand, you know, we can take small samples of a larger population, um, but I think the statistics were, sorry, I'm just looking at that slide. Um, basically, I think it, it said that there were 20 individuals who are um, Black or African American and um, 20, and another, uh, or anyway, sorry, it was 15% uh, Black uh 8% Asian Pacific Islander. And I just wanted to flag, those are actually higher than our percentage in our city. So, um, you know, the, the black individuals, I just looked it up is about 6% and then Asian Pacific Islander, Islander about 3%. So I'm not going to draw conclusions from those numbers in the, in the reverse, but it does suggest that there may be some, some disproportionate impact there. Um, but again, we, we would want to look at the numbers before we claim that. And then my, my question, I guess it's, it's, so the, the premise of the scoff law law is if you don't pay your fines, you can get your car taken away. And I understand that it sounds like there's a correlation with other unsafe behaviors, aggressive driving, things like that. Um, but also, let's say somebody was an aggressive driver, going back to Mr. Perez's Verdia's point, um, if they did pay all their fines, they wouldn't end up on the scoff law list. So I guess, so what is, what is the 
general protection for somebody who say is high income, basically is, is an aggressive driver, can afford to pay all these fines and, and maybe gets, you know, a few every year and pays them every year. They're not, it sounds like they're not on the radar of this and there's no mechanism for their car to get taken away, for example. So I guess that that's, I guess I'm still, I understand there's value to this program, but I'm still stuck on that idea that there is this really strong correlation with not being able to afford to pay your fines. Granted, it it is and sounds like it is typically um, areas where they are are breaking the law. But I'm still concerned that we're not we're not really getting to the folks who can pay those fines and then just can keep doing that same behavior over and over. I think the only if they are if they even if they can't afford to pay their fines, they'll accumulate enough points where they won't have a license. And like this has nothing to do with the police department, but if they're driving suspended canceled or revoked, they are arrested. That is a criminal offense. And it, it would be up to the courts to actually decide uh, whether there should be, an, if you have enough of those violations, eventually, hopefully they're going to be put in jail to help curb that behavior. Thank you. Um, I actually have a follow-up question to Ms. Brawley's, which is, is our scoff law ordinance specific to the needs of Anchorage or is it just an import from state policy? Because what I'm hearing about the need is safety. And what I'm learning is that there's a, there's some of that, but there are some who are kind of caught in its net that aren't necessarily um, aggressive drivers. Or so. so I'm wondering how much we've tailored it. Is it a 100% homegrown ordinance? I don't know enough about its history. Yeah, I'm looking to you, Mr. Hess. Do you know? So the municipality of Anchorage uh, went down to Juneau in 2007, 2008 to lobby for a statute that would enable local governments to enact a scoff law ordinance. And to date, Anchorage is the only local government that has enacted one. So, so it was put in statute at the behest of the municipality of Anchorage. But the, at the time, the, there, there's, there's nothing in state statute similar until a couple of years ago when the legislature enacted the state scoff law code, which requires the DMV cancel the driver's license of any individual with $1,000 or more in unpaid traffic fines. Okay, just really quickly, so we'll make sure I got my question answered. But what we drafted for ordinance was something we came up with whole cloth because we were authorized to do so yes. by the state. Yes, originally the, the assembly passed a code that made it a misdemeanor and then it had a start date that was later on in the year, effective date, to allow the legislature to pass the statute to enable it, but the legislature refused to make it a misdemeanor. Instead, they made uh, the vehicle, uh, 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 you know, uh, a new... So then the assembly had to go back and change the code. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, all right. Oh, Mr. Volan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, for me, just a very interesting, this whole conversation and um, looking at the, the substitute version versus the original. And I understand what this is doing is just essentially keeping the fine in place, but increasing... Um, keeping scoff on face, but increasing the, the total fine amount, which um, I can see that as a good step. I think the reason why I'm wrestling um, personally, even with the original ordinance is because I think driving is a privilege. And um, this kind of goes to like my whole philo philosophy of trying to make Anchorage more people centric and less car centric. Um, on a related note, one thing I have a lot of concern over, and this doesn't pertain to this ordinance, but we're talking about towing companies. I know that there's been cars that have been towed to like the third and Ingress site and left there and people told they can have these junk cars for free. So I just want to flag that for Chief Curl. And then I also want to, I do want to respond briefly to um, your moment of personal privilege, but just, just let me say, I, I think that this is a, uh, a great presentation that you put together. And I think it really helps to have in these work sessions, the data put before us so that we can really see what the implementation looks like. Um, so thanks. Thank you, Mr. Voland. Do you have just a few more slides? That was it, that was the last slide. Okay, Mr. Colhase. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to I wanted to thank uh, everybody for the good discussion and for the recognition of Chief Curl's uh, initial comments and for the discussion around the law. I just had a couple comments. I'm, I'm, I'm not an attorney, I'm a driver. Um, it, it, but I think I think it is important to keep in mind that what Chief Curl said is that at the end of the day, these people are either breaking the law or breaking a city ordinance. Um, and there are, as Chief Curl pointed out, there are, there are third parties. I understand there's third parties who may loan vehicles who could be impacted by this, but there's also the innocent third parties, your families who are driving along. I personally know people who have been in accidents with uninsured drivers. And sometimes it's a mess. You would think your insurance will step in and take care of it. That isn't always the case. And it, it can be a financial hardship for the innocent third party who is driving or walking or biking or whatever. So um, I I don't know if you have had the chance to look at the, the list, the 37-page list. I perused it this morning. There's one individual with 58 citations. There's another with 67, owing 24,000 in fines. That individual is a member of what is clearly a family because of very distinctive last name, three or four other members of the family, 86 citations, $30,000 in fines. Any number of, of people with um, more than 20 citations, 10,000, 10,000, 11,000, 17,000, 19,000. So these, these are chronic offenders. So we're certainly open to compromise. Um, interested in a tool that retains the ability to for the police department to do the protection that they clearly want to do and then i just wanted to close by nobody has to answer but how many moving violations have many of us received i was thinking this morning i think i received one and i was 16 years old so some of us have received more maybe some of a perfect I driving plead the fifth i plead the fifth <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the invitation, but I don't think I'm going to put that on the record. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colhays. Next, I have uh, Mr. Perez Verdi in the queue, and then I'm in the queue. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still struggling with the what the purpose of this is. I'm, and I am, and I, and I'm not sure I really do do understand. I, I, I do hear that, that, that. There's a the, the relationship I'm trying to figure out is these people owe us money, um, and so we're going to take their car. Like, why don't we take their house? Why don't we take their watch? Like, what? Like, what, I don't understand what the relationship there's be, between the fines. And I guess the they're getting fined because they've done something wrong in their car, with their car, related to their car in some way. And so it's you know if 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 you don't. If you don't pay your mortgage, then eventually they're going to take your house, right? But, but the so so that that's but what I what I don't understand is the relationship to, again towards the these people are unsafe, these people are 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 dangerous, these people are creating a problem with us. That that that's the piece that I don't really get. Um, now I understand that that it's probably likely that. Um, people that get their houses taken away, if you were to if you were to do a study of all of those pe people and create a list of all those people that have gotten their houses taken away from them, you'd probably find some some relationship between those. There's they'd probably find that there is some some, some um, demographic information or sort of so socioeconomic information. You might even find a criminal history relationship with those with those folks. But, but that's what I'm that's what I'm struggling with is it feels like like a, an interesting stretch and um, and and it feels a little bit like we're targeting people who can't afford to pay fines as opposed to taking dangerous people off the road and that's what I'm I, I'm I'm wondering why we wouldn't uh, it's, anyway it's a bit of a challenging thing for so, me to get, get get my head around so I'm gonna try to okay th this is gonna be real philosophical here but I'm going to try to explain it so the, the people on this list, again, seven to eight violations. What this, this when we do away with laws with, like this and there's no consequences, basically it undermines the, the legitimacy of government and the police department. The, we all know when governments and the police department have legitimacy, people are compliant with the laws. When stuff like, when people blatantly continue to violate the law, then they accumulate the fines. 
And once they're on the scoff law, they're notified they're on the scoff law. And if they continue to drive when they do, it they're basically they're saying that the rules imposed by the government and enforced by the police department, I don't legitimately recognize them and I'm going to continue to do this. And I think the dip in driving, like Mr. Volan says, it's a privilege. And I think it goes along the, it is the bigger picture and it does, these people, not again, I'm going to say these, but not all of them, but they continue to violate the law because they don't recognize the legitimacy of either government or the police department. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is is um, so um, the 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 number of violations makes a lot more sense to me, right? Because because that you are you're a repeat offender, you are you are violating it more and more and more, as opposed to you owe us this amount of money, and that's the thing that I think is 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 a difficult, and I, that may be logistically really hard to do, but but that makes more sense to me. To, to, to say you have violated X in the amount of times you're, you're, you're out of here. You're, we lose this or whatever. Um, as opposed to, to, to saying it, it's because of the amount of money you owe us. So that's, that's just my initial thought. Thank you. Um, I have myself, the Miss Bronga, Mr. Soul and Miss Bradley. Um, the, the, I'm where, um, Mr. Perez Verdia is, it feels a little bit like three strikes laws. It's like you hit a threshold and you're, you're penalized and I get, People should follow the law, absolutely. But I'm still feeling the disconnect between severity, number, and fine. Um, and so it feels like there's a way to possibly thread that needle in a way that feels equitable, still carries out the rule of law, and doesn't inadvertently have some of the effects that people are concerned about, along with um, hopefully finding a mechanism that if you're that third party who just actually, that's actually my question. Do we ever have it an instance where we find that the third party car is a stolen vehicle? And then at that point, does the person have to pay to get their car back? I'm sure that has happened. <laughs> I, I, they probably would, they would have to pay the towing charge because that is the, we would waive the, the administrative fee, I'm sure, but the towing company, somebody sells pay for that. And as you know, I complain about my towing budget every year because it, it's never enough. So I can't say it hasn't happened. I'm sure it has once or twice. Because a lot of times when the vehicles are there, they change, stolen vehicles change the license plates. And if the officer, very rarely would he go up and actually check the vehicle identification number to make sure it matched. He'd assume that it was the car. Great. I'm going to ask this question, but allow an answer offline, which is how is notice given? And if you could outline that process to us, maybe via email, or is it just a random piece of mail? Um, and then move on to Ms. Bronga. Okay, I'm going to echo um, the driving is a privilege, not just a right. Um, we do have a bus system. If someone cannot comply with driving laws, I don't feel like they should be allowed to continue if it's just over and over. I do think I, I like um, where Mr. Perez Verdia was going with maybe number of violations versus a dollar figure because uh, it just, you know, if someone's repeat, it may be more important than how much money they're racking up. I think I'm reading in here that you're moving it to 2,500, 2,500 and that it's not equipment violations, it would be moving violations, which I, I like the idea of that. Is that what, is that correct? Hi, this is Charles Gunther. Um, so I think the administration is open to uh, making equitable changes and that was a uh, increase that was discussed. I guess what I would like to say is that I, um, I think there needs to be a balancing between the number of citations and the nature of the citations, because I mean, you can think of a situation where somebody has, you know, I mean, when you look at the, I was looking at the top 50, number one has 79 citations owing about $26,950. Number 50 has, is the scoff list of, as of today, it has 30 citations of $7,000. I mean, I, I agree that there needs to be, I mean, I think it's fair to say that 
people who have multiple violations are going to have you know higher fines. But I could I could conceive of a situation where somebody has multiple violations, minor violations, that are maybe not um, you know so, so the fine may not uh, be really uh, reflective of the seriousness of of the of the uh, of the uh, citation. So I think there needs to be some sort of balancing on that. Um, I mean, I will. You should remember that the thousand dollar threshold was set in two thousand and seven. I mean, 16 years ago. So, um, I mean, fines have gone up. So that's why I think there's recognition that that thousand dollars, you know, may be outdated, and there needs to be some recognition that, you know, and may, maybe Chief Curl disagrees, but that is a number that is old. Okay, okay, and um, so that's that's why, you know, that twenty five hundred dollars, you might, you in your wisdom, may determine it should be something different, but. Um, but I, I, I can see the wisdom of also discussing having a number of citations. But you can look at the uh, list as Kent talked about, and there's um, and the chief referenced, and there's um, you know you can kind of average what the average citation is. I can't remember what Chief Carl said it was, but that's a good discussion to have. I also also say that and it was referenced that we are somewhat um, constricted. We do have a contract with Vulcan, so there's some discussion about. Um, maybe waiving fees for people that were sort of innocent. I mean, someone's going to have to grapple with how we're going to, who's going to pay Vulcan for that. I mean, Mr. Pally's going to have to pay that one way or the other. Um, in many other situations, DWIs and other situations, someone's car gets used by a grandson or a, a brother, and the remedy is to seek restitution in the, in the case and, and get reimbursed. And that's, that's not a perfect solution, but that maybe you know, people have to have some responsibility and skin in the game, if you will. So something to consider as well. I don't know if I answered your question, but if you have anything else, I'd be happy to try to answer. Well, I was just, so like I, the, on this um, deal where it says moving violations only, I, I was wondering if we could spell out like, you know, driving without a license, uh, no insurance, and then reckless driving, like speeding and um, red light running rather than parking tickets. Thank you, Ms. Bronga. Um, next, we have Mr. Solt, then Ms. Brawley, then Mr. Johnson. And we have about 15 minutes left. Thank you. So I'll try to be fairly quick. So I think monetary value is probably as citations or the monetary value is based on probably severity. So maybe another way to be points because points are also probably based on severity. Mm -hmm. So once you reach a certain threshold of points, we get rid of the monetary value, the number of tickets all out the window. Um, it would be good to have that number of, of third party vehicles that are taken. Um, and I, I, get, I get the DUI portion, that makes sense. Uh, and then also be curious, um, the auction value for the cars, 90 cars, roughly $1,000 per car. So, are are we not getting the value there? Are they or is it cheaper to buy a beater and drive that, knowing that when I get pulled over, you're going to take it, and I'm just going to go get another beater and keep pressing my luck? So, and then I, I kind of get right with the scoff law because, as far as the consequences, because you know I brush my teeth, I floss, I go to the dentist, and I've never had a cavity. So why am I doing all this stuff? So thanks. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Uh, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. I was curious about scoff law laws. I was just doing some Googling. And um, outside of Anchorage, it looks like often cities do have programs like that, but they have to do with unpaid uh, parking tickets. And one thing I saw is, and, and I know this specifically excludes parking tickets, and we're talking about a different a different uh, breaking of the law. Um, but I was curious because I know in those other cities, I was fortunate to have never gotten one, but I know uh, if you don't pay your parking tickets in the city of Chicago and a lot of other places, they put a boot on your car. And it sounds like that's actually, and so basically that's something that is affixed to the wheel. You can't take it off yourself and it prevents you from moving the car. And I, I also understand there's maybe more of a nexus there with parking, although it makes it harder to move the car if you have a parking violation. I, I just wondered, is that... Um, is that something that's ever been discussed in this city? Because it also sounds like it um, is potentially, it's a way to, to immobilize the car, requires somebody who has, you know, the key to the boot to take it off, and it's cheaper than towing. Um, so I just wondered, just as, you know, again, if, if, if part of the goal is to have the car not move or some, the person who's causing the problem not move it, is there a way to lessen the, the burden on folks um, and not tow in all situations? 
So we've never used boots here, so it would have to be something I look into. Great. Thank you, Ms. Burley. Thank you, Chief Curl. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Um, just <laughs> a couple thoughts. One, I, I do think there is, well, it's imperfect, some some value in using a dollar amount as opposed to to the number of citations. You know, I mean, I'll, maybe I, I won't get the strikes. It's been a while since I wrote a speeding ticket, but, you know, if it's 10 miles an hour or less under over the speed limit, then it's like eight dollars per mile an hour. And I think as you get up past 20 miles an hour plus over the limit, it's twenty dollars per mile an hour. So, you know, I mean, the, the people are going around just driving a little bit too fast. You get ticketed, but it, it's not terribly consequential. You find these people driving 20, 30, 40 miles an hour over the limit. That's where you start getting into the high dollar quantities. And frankly, those are the people who I think really terrify us out on the roadway. So um, in, in that sense, I don't think this is a bad mechanism. I'll also just say, you know, I, I understand that there may be some people who, who don't necessarily who we sympathize with, you know, because they lend their car to somebody and then it gets seized because that person was on the scofflaw list. But I do think you accept a certain degree of responsibility when you let someone borrow your car, right? I let my wife borrow my car because I know how she drives and I have faith that she's a safe driver. If some person I barely know comes up to me and says, hey, Zach, can I borrow your car? Um, and it ends up getting seized because they were on the scofflaw list. I would feel like I was not doing my due diligence and making sure that this ultimately potentially very dangerous instrument was being used by someone who, who's not a responsible party. Um, but at the end of the day, in, in terms of whether or not I support our scofflaw law, I, I see how it's imperfect. Um, and I'd be open to a better system. Uh, but frankly, whether or not, you know, I mean, until there is a better, more effective proposal on the table, am I ready to get rid of this? I mean, the answer is no, because I think it does do more good than it does harm. You know, I mean, we're talking about one to 2% of the population of Alaska or Anchorage who accounts for almost 14% of serious and fatal accidents. Like that is a strong correlation between the people who end up on this list and the people who are injuring other folks on the motorways. And I, given the, the likelihood of this small subset of our population to hurt innocent people, you know, with their vehicles until there's something else that is, you know, going to be at least if not more effective and, and curbing this behavior, or at least taking away this dangerous instrument, um, it, it would be hard for me to, to get rid of this. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, anybody else for the queue? Um, Mr. Hess and then Mr. Colhase. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I've been looking at the Scofflaw ordinance, the code, and I've done a lot of research for the last few years. And one thing I've never been able to wrap my head around is one day, Monday, you owe $1,500 in unpaid fines. You're the worst of the worst. We have to get you off the streets. You're going to kill somebody. You write a check, and the next day, you're good to go. There's no uh, probationary license. There's no required driver's training. From one day to the next, you simply pay money and you're suddenly a good driver. I've never been able to wrap my head around that. And I've spent a lot of time looking at this. And I, I wanna make our office the number one concern, which I explained to legal, is the impacts on people who are not on the scofflaw. So in 2015, 62% of the vehicles impounded under the scofflaw code were registered to somebody other than the scofflaw. In 2016, it was 73%. 2017, it was 75%. 2018, it was 76%. And 2019, it was 79%. And these are older stats that I got from former assistant municipal attorney, uh, Pam Weiss, when she and I were discussing this. And in 2015, 22% of those vehicles registered to somebody other than the scofflaw were not reclaimed. In 2015, that was in 2015, 2016, 49% were not reclaimed. 2017, 51% were not reclaimed. 2018, 61% were not reclaimed. And in 2019, 58% were not reclaimed. So in that five years between 2015 and 2019, 286 vehicles impounded under the scofflaw code that were registered to somebody other than the scofflaw driver were not reclaimed. And looking at the chief slide, 
many of those individuals who did nothing but loan their vehicle to somebody also get sent to collections because their car was auctioned off and it didn't cover the towing and impound fees. So there are some serious impacts to people. We recently had somebody contact our office. They were with a rental agency in Fairbanks that rented a car to somebody who drove it to Fairbanks. They got here, they got pulled over, they were on the scofflaw. Well, Fairbanks does, doesn't have our scofflaw list. There was a 67 year old grandmother who loaned her vehicle. She's on social security living on 1200 a month. That car is important to her to get to the doctor, you know, to, to go shopping. She loaned it to her grandson who had a valid driver's license. He was pulled over, she lost her vehicle. There's the individual in Midtown who owned the, uh, he owns a, a, a pesticide company, uh, our pest uh, uh, removal company. He hired somebody, he checked the driver's license, their record going back five years, they had a clean record. Hired the guy, he got pulled over. Well, he owed some fines that were eight or nine years old. So that business vehicle got impounded. There are negative impacts on people who are doing nothing wrong. If you loan your vehicle to somebody and they don't have a dr valid driver's license, it's going to get impounded and that's your fault. You need to check. But if they have a valid driver's license and you loan the vehicle to them, you've done nothing wrong, but it's, it's seriously impacting individuals. And uh, it, it, I just don't think it's fair or reasonable uh, for, for the municipality to be seizing pe people's vehicles because they just loaned them to somebody if they have a valid driver's license. And you know, to the chief's point that we don't just pull you over for, for uh, being on the scofflaw, I've lived in Anchorage 58 years. The last 37 years I've lived in Fairview, a very diverse economically and racially diverse neighborhood. And back in the day when I had a beater vehicle, because that's all I could afford that got me to work, I was pulled over by APD multiple times for driving suspiciously. And at the time I felt it was because I was driving an old car in Fairview. Didn't get a ticket, I had insurance, I had a valid registration, no burned out headlights or taillights, but I was driving suspiciously. So sometimes you're not necessarily violating the law when you get pulled over. So can I ask a question to maybe put a fine point on your comment, which is the ombudsman's concern with this is about the folks who aren't the violators, but who are kind of caught up otherwise because they've loaned their cars. Sure. Okay. That's our number one concern. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Colhais. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Hess, for those comments. Um, I think to lead off, Madam Chair, you mentioned compromise, and, and I think you know, I'm glad we're having this discussion. Thinking about the the innocent third parties, I, I don't know if there's an opportunity to look at something that would be along the lines of when a, a scoff law is stopped in a vehicle they don't own, that the first time the registered owner gets a letter saying, by the way, your vehicle was stopped in, in a in commission of a traffic offense and the driver was a scofflaw, be aware that after two or three of those occurrences, your vehicle will be um, impounded. Um, I, I don't know if something like that would be a tool that could be in the toolbox of this compromise we're looking at. Um, so anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colhase. Um, We have just a few minutes left. Any other members? Okay. Um, well, we're going to have Mr. Folland and then I'll turn back. Yeah, thank you. You know, looking through that packet, there just does seem to be a lot of one citation or two citations. And so whether it's upping the amount or I, I do like the idea of maybe upping the, the number of citations um, as the metric, you know, it seems if, if somebody has one citation and they meet the, the monetary threshold, that's not ideal. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to you in just a second, Mr. Hess. Um, I want to throw out, as we're throwing out ideas, alternative, and this was from what Ms. Brock was saying, maybe alternative routes to be removed from the scofflaw list, like going to traffic school or another alternative, um, so that if you can't pay the fines legitimately, you have maybe another route. I don't know. And I don't know if the money would be better spent on traffic school or paying the fine. I have no idea. Mr. Hess. So recently, Mr. Rivera and I spoke with... Uh the state of Alaska Division of Motor Vehicles, they 
are set up now to implement the scofflaw statute that requires the DMV to cancel the driver's license of any individual who accumulates $1,000 or more in unpaid traffic fines. It would be up to the municipality to notify them, to send them the names, and they would cancel the driver's license unless the individual set up a payment plan. And I agree with what Mr. Volan said, driving is a privilege, which is why I think the state's approach makes more sense where you cancel the driver's license because having a driver's license is not a right, it's a privilege. And as the chief said, if somebody's pulled over with a canceled driver's license, you're gonna impound that vehicle. Not all the time. But you can. Okay. I am really quick. We're almost out of time. Thank you. Just want to tag on to your idea of I like a point system or some kind of sunsetting as well, because you know the the 53 year old Randy is very different than the 16 year old Randy. Um, so they should expire over time, but the fines may remain. Um, anyone? Re yep, we have one minute. Go for it. Through the chair, thank you. I just uh, wanted to sort of explain what this S version is. It's an attempt, as you might know, to raise the fine. A point system is fine too, if if, if that's something you, you you're thinking. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, the paper violations, the things like the traffic light out or the seat belt not being operative or something. Um, all those are very important. I'm not denigrating the significance of them, but in terms of whether somebody has a thousand dollars to put toward their rent one month or a thousand dollars to put toward their fine, that could be. That's why the that the, this is this the, th the thinking behind the raising up of the amount, um, and then you know the paper fine versus the moving violation fine. So I just wanted to clarify that. But this is this is an imperfect uh, solution. It's just a start, um, and of course we have until the twenty fifth, and we're open to hearing from anybody. There's some good suggestions here. So if you do have any suggestions that you think might work, um, certainly reach out and let us know. Thank you, Ms. Helzer. And um, if for some reason there's an S1 or another version coming, just be mindful um, that you could still get that in the addendum um, and because there is public hearing set for this on uh, the 25th. So that would be the greatest notice possible. Um, with that, have a good weekend. We're adjourned.